Hey everyone, my name is Jocelyn Ramirez and I'm the chef and founder of Todo Verde. Thank you so much for joining me tonight for this uh, cooking class making pozole rojo. Uh, thank you to Tastemade for bringing us all together. And again, thank you so much to our friends at Honda for making this class possible. So we're gonna get right into it. I wanna make sure we have enough time to go over all the elements of our pozole. If you have never made pozole before, there are a variety of different types of pozole that you can make. Today, we're focusing on pozole rojo. Other common known ones are pozole verde, which is more of like a tangy tomatillo base with fresh chiles. And then there's also pozole blanco, which is um, a broth that focuses really on the corn, on the maíz, and doesn't have any chiles at all, which is why it's called pozole blanco, because it's a white or clear broth. But today with our um, pozole rojo, we are going to be using dried chiles, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but I really want to get to the star of the pozole, which is the maíz, and I'm going to bring a pot over to my cutting board to give you a glimpse of the maíz that I've had cooking for a little bit. So I'm using a uh, yellow maíz, and it's been cooking in just water with some salt for the last few hours. Um, to get a little bit of a heads up, I sometimes use um, like an Instapot or some sort of a pressure cooker to make the process go a little bit faster. But essentially what I did is I had a non-GMO dried organic corn that you will rehydrate overnight in just water, same way that you would cook, you know, rehydrate beans overnight. And then, cook them in enough water and salt that would um, get them nice and plump and rehydrated. And sometimes you'll see a little bit of the maize burst as well, which is really nice. Um, the, we sometimes call this like a bloomed um, part of the maize or bloom piece of maize. And so I've been just keeping an eye on it, making sure that I have a couple inches of water submerging the maize at all times. So you want to make sure it doesn't dry out or that you're running out of liquid or that it eventually might burn. You want to make sure that you're constantly paying uh, care and attention to this maize. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to season this broth with a couple of bay leaves, some dried Mexican oregano and some cumin. And I'm just going to add that to my broth as I let it continue to simmer and cook before I add my chile base to it and I'll bring that back to the stove and let that keep brewing. So for pozole, it's definitely that time of the year right now where lots of families are getting together and pozole tamales are definitely the heart of what's being served on the table. So I love making a few different varieties. Sometimes I've used jackfruit, mushrooms, a whole lot of different things um, that can go into this, but mushrooms are definitely the easiest. Um, you can definitely source mushrooms pretty easily. and before we get into cooking the mushrooms, I'm because I'm going to use one pan and make our lives a little bit easier, I'm going to just toast some dried chiles. So I have two varieties of chiles. One of them is guajillo, and here's one with the stem that I was just going to de-seed um, so that you all can see how to kind of work with dried chiles. You'll see it's a more narrow, long chile, definitely more mild in flavor. Sometimes you'll get a little bit more heat from this one. Um, and then you have uh, ancho chile, which is a little bit wider. And this is a dried pasilla chile. And this um, is not as, as much heat, not as much capsaicin in this chile. Uh, what you definitely feel here is like a slightly kind of smoky raisin with a little bit of heat. So I'm going to start dry toasting these. And as I'm toasting them, which is just going to take a couple minutes, I invite you all to join me in the chat and ask any questions that come up, especially if you've never made pozole before and you have questions. Um, please let me know in the chat what's on your mind, if you've worked with dry chiles before, or if you've made pozole, what your favorite things are to add to your pozole, whether it's a, a meat-based protein or I'd love to know what your veggie protein of choice is. So I'm going to add this to a dry skillet, no oil in here. And I'll bring this just so you can see, it's a, just a dry skillet that I've been preheating. And essentially all I'm gonna do is I'm going to add my chiles here to start toasting. And this will be just maybe a minute or so on each side. And while my chile anchos are toasting, I'm just going to de-seed my chile guajillo. So I just literally took the stem off of the chile 
and I'm just going to open up the chile with my finger. Some people like to use scissors here, so I'm just literally cracking that chile open and I'm getting the seeds out of the chile. This is gonna create bitter notes, so you definitely want to omit them as much as possible. You can get rid of a little bit of the flesh of the inside of the chile, but mostly you're focusing on trying to extract the seeds and those could be composted, you can um, toss them. We're not going to be using them any further. We really want to focus on just the skin of the chile. So here I have, and there's my dog trying to trip me right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she needs to go to her place, but she knows I'm cooking and she's trying to get some little food scraps. So I'm going to just turn my chiles over. And with the anchos, it's a little bit harder to see. The color of the anchos is definitely darker but you can sometimes see a little bit of browning. You can see a little bit of bubbling that starts to happen. And once those come off, I'll add my guajillo chiles and toast those. And I'm at about a medium heat for that. So somebody's asking if we can use a reserve seeds um, like red pepper flakes. The answer is, I mean, you can if you want to. I haven't done that, but typically no. Um, for, dry, for these variety of dried chiles, uh, we typically focus on just the... Um, the skin or the flesh of the chiles, not so much the seeds because they're a little bit bitter. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, variety we use for red pepper flakes. That's actually a great question that I should look into because I use quite a bit of red pepper flakes and I know those do have the seeds in them. But great question. Keep them coming. Let me know any other questions that come up. So once these chiles are coming off the hot dry skillet, no oil here, you can pan fry them. But for this I'm totally okay with just doing a dry skillet and just toasting them. You could also do that over an open flame. That's more called a, a technique called tatamados. Uh, so you're using that open flame to just slightly char them. I have a couple cups of vegetable broth that I just had in a small pot here just to bring it up to a nice hot temperature that's going to help my chiles rehydrate faster. And I'm going to start adding, you can see, maybe I'll do it up against, put it up against this broth here. I don't know if you can see a little bit of the browning and bubbling of the chiles here. It might be a little hard to see, but you're looking for a little bit of browning, bubbling, and that's just going to go directly into my vegetable broth. And so now that I have my ancho chiles in the broth, I'm going to now put my guajillo chiles in that same skillet. And I can hear a little bit of toasting here. And I just want to cook these again for like a minute or so on each side. And for these, you can see the color transform a little bit. You're going to start to see a little bit of blackening. You want to just get a little bit of that blackening on there just to um, bloom the flavor. You'll be able to smell the toastiness of the chile, the oils kind of um, um, starting to work their magic and becoming more fragrant of a chile. You don't want to burn them. Once you start smoking and coughing and they're burning, uh, chances are they're going to be a lot more bitter. And so you want to be careful not to do that. So I'm going to flip my chiles over. And again, I'm on about medium heat. You can see a touch of blackening here. You see that? That's enough. So I want to just go ahead and flip that over and I can smell how fragrant these are. They smell so good. So if I was cooking these in some oil, hot oil, it would go a little bit faster. So because we're toasting, it's about a minute to two minutes per side. So another question, do you think a beginner cook could pull this dish off? Absolutely, yes. Uh, my main thing is get good quality corn. The, the star, like I said here, is that big pot of maize. If you can cook beans, which most people can, you can definitely cook a big pot of really good grade corn and that's going to be the heart and soul of the broth everything is going to taste really great with it so i'm going to pull these chiles off see i'm getting a little bit of blackening here so i'm going to pull those chiles off and i'm going to toss those into my vegetable broth and i just want to make sure that these are completely submerged into the broth and I'm just gonna put the lid on and let those rehydrate for maybe about 10 minutes until they're nice and soft and pliable. So I'll just set those aside until we're ready to start working with them. I'm gonna drop my heat in that dry skillet and I'm gonna use it again though. I just put it down to low heat and I'm going to cook my mushrooms in there. So 
use that same skillet to um, have one less thing that you have to wash at the end of the night. Any tips on finding good quality corn? Yes, uh, definitely um, uh, look for something that's non-GMO organic corn. Um, because it's just the corn itself, you are going to be able to just Google like, you know, dry nixtamalized hominy or, or you can even just search dry pozole and be able to find some really good quality varieties. Um, when you're looking at masarina, for example, to make tortillas, tamales, uh, because it's already ground, um, that masarina sometimes has a lot of other fillers and uh, preservatives in them. When, whenever you're looking for masarina, look for something that literally on the back of the label says corn, ideally organic corn, trace a lime or just lime. Sometimes there'll be salt, very rarely. Um, but you just want to focus on making sure it's a good quality corn. If it's American grown, great. If it's Mexican grown, great. Um, there's really great brands on out there that are focusing on corn. So before I start shredding these up, I just wanted to show you, I'm using a medley of mushrooms here. Definitely use whatever mushrooms are easy for you to find. Um, but I'm using, um, King, uh, King oyster or trumpet mushrooms, regular oyster mushrooms, and a few other varieties. I have also some, uh, uh, shiitake mushrooms here. Uh, so everything is going to get shredded except for the shiitakes. I'll just uh, slice those up. And for, you know, any of the variety of mushrooms that you get, you just want to make sure that you're getting the ones that will sear really nicely, um, that have a good amount of flavor on their own, essentially. So growing up in a low income neighborhood, a lot of times the only mushrooms that you can find were just white button mushrooms. And they're fine and all, but they don't have a ton of flavor. And so now, as I've really started to explore plant-based, um, there's just so many mushroom varieties out there that have so much flavor. And I just was not getting those um, in my regular everyday diet. So, you know, now you can get some that actually tastes a little bit of the sea or like oysters, um, or that you can really blossom and bloom to start to really bring on additional flavor profiles. So all I'm doing for the oyster mushrooms is I'm just shredding them by hand. So I'm just, you know, breaking them down, breaking down the florets a little bit. If the mushroom itself is kind of large, I'll just shred it in half or in quarters until I get these nice kind of um, long strips. And essentially what you're trying to do here is emulate something that looks like a shredded chicken, shredded pork, which is the proteins of choice that you typically see in pozole and you know interesting story when i first started um, making plant-based pozole uh, many years ago people were telling me uh, we'll just call them haters because they were haters um they were like uh your pozole is not traditional because it doesn't have chicken or pork in it so that's not a real traditional pozole and my clap back to that was actually chicken or pork wasn't available to us pre-colonization. That's a colonial food that came um, with the Spaniards coming onto our land. Uh, prior to that, pozole was made, but it didn't have chicken or pork. It was used with, made with other animals of the land. Uh, kind of a creepy story that I read about um, is that there might have even been human flesh in pozole before. So like if you're talking about tradition, things were kind of crazy back then. Um, and so their pozole is not traditional and neither is mine. So here we are now. Let's find that middle ground. This is still a really delicious pozole that I love to make for my family and they love it. So you can definitely keep exploring and evolving what pozole looks like for you. Um, but it doesn't have to be the chicken or the pork is my point. So for king oyster mushroom, uh, you can hand shred or sometimes folks um, can use just like a fork to just score the outside of the mushroom, as you can see here. And that just kind of helps you shred it up a little bit more. If you're finding that the, the stem of your mushroom feels a little bit tough, the very bottom base of your mushroom, you can always trim that with a knife, just cut that off and then just keep working with the parts of the mushroom that feel a little bit more tender and soft to the touch. And then once I score it, you can just use your hands to help you shred that up into little strips. 
and you can keep scoring and shredding. Or if you prefer bigger pieces of mushroom, you can obviously slice or dice that up. And I'm trying to find like the perfect angle where the you can see the mushrooms just right. Yeah, that's pretty good. Or you can just do sort of big organic looking pieces of mushroom that might look more like a big chunk of shredded chicken or shredded pork. And so now that I have all of this broken down, I'm gonna cook these mushrooms in that same skillet that I had my chiles toasting in. I'm gonna make sure to clean that out because it, I see a couple seeds in there that have at this point burned. So just clean that out, it's a dry skillet, really easy to clean. I'm gonna turn this back up to a medium low heat. It's really hot, I can feel how hot it is. I'm just gonna put some, uh, I'm using rice bran oil, you can use grapeseed or any high temp cooking oil. And the thing about mushrooms is you don't want to um, be shy about your oil. They can take in quite a bit of oil, so you can definitely get, hit them with quite a bit of oil to make sure that they get nice and seared. And I'm just going to place them in my skillet. And I'm just gonna add all of them. Typically, I'll try to do this in batches just to not overcrowd my skillet too much. And right now I'm not gonna season them just yet. I like to wait until my mushrooms get slightly brown, slightly seared. And once they get to that kind of nice point, then I hit them with a little bit of salt. I'm gonna hit them with a little bit of cumin. You can add any of your other favorite seasonings. You can add garlic, onion powder, whatever else you love to add to amplify those flavors. And that's just going to create a more delicious dish. Now, I, again, love searing these off with a little bit of oil. That's a really key part of the recipe for me. I've seen folks add raw mushrooms directly into the broth. Of course, they're going to cook in the broth, right? Um, but you're missing that element where you're building flavor. So same way that you would um, braise a piece of meat and some oil and then add the broth to it and let it cook and cook until it's super soft and tender. That process is done because it's adding a layer of flavor, a depth of flavor that you just wouldn't get if you just added the raw ingredient directly to the broth. So really important key step for me here, if I were using jackfruit, if I were using tofu, any other ingredient, I would first pan sear it and then add it to my broth. Yes, it's gonna lose the crispiness, that you're you know, trying to get to, but you're still going to add that depth of flavor to the broth, which is what you want. So I'm just going to let this sear for a few minutes until I get that nice brown sear that I'm looking for. Any other questions in the chat? This is a great moment to jump in here, ask me questions as I'm kind of multitasking here. I'm gonna check on my chiles. When I see a question coming in. And for my chiles, all I'm going to do, I'm going to still let them keep rehydrating, but I can see that my wajillos are floating on the top, not quite submerged in the liquid. So I'm just going to flip them over and add the rehydrated pasillas right on top to kind of weigh them down. You can also add a bowl to this to weigh down the chiles. And I'm just going to submerge them down and give that another few minutes to just keep working in that hot broth. So the question is, let's see, is this mainly a Christmas time dish? Yes and no, depends on the family. So with my family, we typically do tend to eat this dish more towards this time of the year. Um, and in fact, most Mexican families will not celebrate on Christmas day. Uh, we celebrate Noche Buena, which is the 24th, and we go until midnight. And uh, this year we're doing a whole block party with the neighborhood uh, at my mom's house. But we were, we will be making pozole tamales for that day. Uh, for some folks, it's just this time of the year, winter season, uh, where more soups are eaten. So like cocido, pozole, menudo, all of our uh, stews and soups are eaten during this time of the year. So... For pozole, you can go to a Mexican restaurant, and dur especially during this time of the year, you'll see it on the menu um, where it's more readily available. It's not specifically only tied to the holiday. It's more of a winter season dish. 
What are my favorite tamales? Ooh, great question. Um, I love, I mean, that's a hard question, everybody. I, I mean, I make quite a few different varieties. Queso con rajas, when the cheese gets like a little bit like melty crispy, that's probably my favorite because uh, the the cheese, like you get a little bit of that like sear on the cheese and then the rajas um, gives it that nice little like spice kick to it. Um, the tamales that I grew up eating mostly are um, uh, the chile rojo tamales. So you'll have like a meat mixed with the chile rojo and it kind of stains a little bit of the masa. Um, those are very nostalgic, near and dear to me. And my family to this day will still make the same recipe. So I have some chile rojo hanging out in my fridge right now ready for um, bringing it all together to make tamales. For sweet tamales, I really like making cacao tamales. I just ate one earlier this morning with some hot tea. So you can, and, and I topped it with popped amaranth and a little bit of um, some shreds of like some really good Mexican chocolate. Um, also strawberry tamales. The more typical sweet tamales are like piña, pineapple or corn or sometimes strawberry. Um, so there's so many different varieties of tamales, but definitely for sweet strawberry, strawberry rose specifically and cacao with popped amaranth. And then, um, Chile rojo and queso con rajas, our favorite. When did you start focusing on plant-based eating and cooking? Oh, great question. I personally started about 10 years ago and uh, it was for health-based reasons, uh, first and foremost. And then I've always been a huge advocate for animals. So it just made sense for me to transition in this way. And then as a business, I started my business seven years ago now where uh, I wanted to be able to have these types of dialogues, share recipes. Um, it got to the point where like my family were guinea pigs for so long, eating all of my plant-based versions of all the things where my, my dad specifically was like, this is your thing. I think that you should pursue this. I was in higher education before this, uh, teaching classes and doing some administrative work on college campus. Um, but now to be able to do this full time, it's so amazing because it opens the door to these types of conversations. I'm able to share recipes on so many different platforms. I have a cookbook that I published, which actually uh, I'm, I'm basing this recipe off of. In the cookbook, I have a uh, jackfruit in the pozole rojo, and here today we're using mushrooms. But it's definitely been something that's been an ongoing journey where we can have a lot of really great dialogues on how to support our communities who are dealing with so many preventable health issues with eating more of a plant-based diet. So was it tough to get your family on board with plant-based eating? Yes and no. I, what I found is that uh, like recently we as a family have been getting together and um, a lot of folks are like, you look so much younger than everybody else. Uh, it's crazy and, it, it, and they're right. Um, so like people are seeing that I have been able to like maintain a healthy weight or like, um, uh, you know, or like just physically appearance look a lot younger than everybody else or aren't dealing with a lot of health issues. Um, and so that's one thing where it's just kind of like lead by example, just live your life and people will start to see, Hey, something's working for her here where she's not dealing with all the things that we're dealing with health wise. Um, and so that's, that's interesting. Like, let me learn more about that. Um, but the other thing is just if you make really good food and they like it, they will be open to it. Family will be open to it. So initially family was kind of like, oh, why, why are you? I remember there was a holiday where I made a poblano mac and cheese and my brother came in the kitchen and he's like, I was I was all cooking up a storm, getting my mac and cheese ready. And he was like, you're making mac and cheese. I thought you were you were plant based or you're vegan. And I was like, oh, it's a, it's a vegan mac and cheese. And he was like, why? Why do you have to do that to us? Like, we're always like testing all these recipes. And he was so upset. He wanted real mac and cheese. By the end of the night, he ate three bowls of mac and cheese. And then the next holiday party, he asked me if I can make my mac and cheese, knowing that it was vegan. So if the food is good, you can get people on board. It might be a little skeptical at first, and that's okay. But if it's not good, if it doesn't hit, you're going to have a hard time turning that ship around, right? Um, so it has to be really good is my main thing. 
All right, so I'm getting a nice sear on these mushrooms. Keep the questions coming in the chat. I love it. So I'm going to bring these up to the camera, and you can see I have some nice browning, some sizzling of my mushrooms. I like to keep this going even more so, but we got to keep our pozole dish going. So I'm going to season this with some salt. I just have some kosher salt that I'm going to sprinkle in there, get these all nice and seasoned up. I also have some ground cumin that I'm going to use to just season these up and give them a nice earthy, slightly smoky flavor. This is going to go back to the skillet because my hand is like, that's heavy. And I'm just going to stir these up and add these to the bowl of the mushrooms that I cooked earlier. So I did a few rounds of mushrooms, like I mentioned earlier. And so what you're looking for is a slightly crispy mushroom, nice browning, a sear. And you want these mushrooms to be so good on their own. That's my main thing for all dishes that I love exploring uh, plant-based versions on, is if I want to eat this whole bowl, bowl of mushrooms by themselves, they're going to be so good in my pozole. So each thing should give its own care, attention should taste good. And when you bring it all together, it's going to be so good all together. So actually, while well, these sear a little bit more because I like a little bit more browning on them, I'm going to put my chiles in a blender. So let me bring my blender base or my blender cup forward. And you can see here that they're nice and soft and rehydrated. This is what you're looking for, a nice pliable, like, you know, chile that's ready to be blended. And I'm going to blend it with that broth that they've been rehydrating in. So I'm going to just put my, let me make sure you have a good view of this. I'm just going to put my chiles directly into the blender using a pair of tongs. Let me drop this down here so you can see a little better. We're like going back and forth trying to find the right angle. Here we go. And then, <laughs> and then I'm going to add that broth directly to the blender. And we're just going to blend until smooth. It's as simple as that. Just blend until super smooth. I'm going to bring this back and it's going to be loud for maybe a minute or so. I want to blend for a little bit until they're nice and smooth and I don't have any pieces of chile. So that took a minute or two, but it's important to make sure your chiles are blended as smooth as possible. I'm going to open it up here so that you can see the consistency. So you can see that I have a nice smooth paste and I'm going in the wrong direction. There we go. A nice smooth paste. Um, and if you don't have a high power blender and you do have little bits of chile hanging out in there, you could always use a fine mesh strainer to strain the chile mixture through the strainer until you get a nice smooth paste. So I have here my pot of my maize that has continued to cook a little further with that cumin, the oregano, the bay leaf. 
Now I'm gonna grab a spatula and I'm going to add my chile mixture directly into the pot and let that just keep going. And we're almost near the finish line. You can obviously, once you add the chile broth, you can let the flavors marry for as long as you'd like to, like, you know, 20, 30 minutes is a good amount of time. The longer, the better. Um, in fact, like most soups, this will be better tomorrow. So you can eat it right away, which I'm going to, but you know, if you eat it tomorrow, it's going to be even more great because the maize is also going to absorb some of that chile flavor. So I'm going to pour this directly into my pot and it's going to stain my broth into this nice red, deep red color. And we'll mix that up. And I'm also going to hang out here with my pot and add my mushrooms. I'm just gonna add everything into the pot. And you can see, ooh, it has this nice deep color. Get rid of that blender cup. There we go. I have a nice sear on this last little bits of mushroom here. So you can see that I've let that cook until I get an, I have a nice sear on them that's what i'm looking for and i'm just going to add these actually directly into the pot here splashing a little bit trying not to splash too much there we go and i'm going to add the other mushrooms that i seared off earlier that are going to go directly into the pot as well. Let me see if I could give you a little bit of a better view. I'm going to just scooch this a little bit forward. There we go. All right. So those are also going to go in. And I really love using shiitakes, especially if I had to choose between my favorite variety that's going into the pozole right now. Shiitakes are really great because they have a nice... Um, like that meaty texture to them. And the flavor is also really great too. So check this out. Look at how good this is looking. You have that nice shredded mushroom in there. I'm gonna taste for salt. I've been seasoning all the way through. I seasoned my broth uh, with just, when it was just maize alone, I seasoned my mushrooms as I cooked them. So everything's been getting seasoned along the way but I just wanna make sure I give it a nice good taste and make sure as a whole that it's seasoned enough. So good, it needs a little bit of salt though. So, so good. You can definitely taste the richness of the chiles, the, but what you taste the most, like I mentioned earlier, the heart of this dish is the corn. So that broth, is so good. Um, I always recommend to folks to please start your pozole with dry, good maize, um, nixtamalized maize, rather than using the canned hominy. Yes, it's a shortcut. Maybe that's what you have available to you that you can use in a pinch, but it's just, it, it does not compare. So I have a question here. What does nixtamalized mean? So nixtamal is a process that our ancestors uh, identified generations ago where dried corn was mixed in a calcium um, limestone solution, or for short, we call it cal. And with that process, typically you bring that cal uh, solution, so it's cal water, dry corn, brought to a simmer, and then you turn off the heat and let it sit in that warm solution for typically overnight is how we do it. So you'll cook that in the evening, turn it off, let it sit on the sit all night. And the next morning you um, wash the mice. So you strain that liquid out, you use your hands to rub the mice and you're removing the outer skin or the outer little shell of the mice and you're unlocking more nutrition, you're making it more digestible, and the maize just has a different flavor. And nixtamal is a process that you typically see with corn, but you can do with a lot of other things. You can, I've, I've eaten like nixtamalized sweet potato. Um, you can really nixtamalize quite a few things and it helps hold up the 
um, the the texture or the structure of that of that particular item that's being nixtamalized. My mouth is watering, just wanting to eat this uh, broth or drink this broth. A touch more salt, just a touch. Wow, so I seasoned every step of the way and I'm still needing quite a bit of salt here. So definitely always taste and make sure that you're getting enough seasoning in there. So let me give that another little mix and taste. So with this nixtamal process, like that's how you unlock this flavor that is unparalleled of corn that then we'll use to make masa for tortillas, masa for tamales, for sopes, for all of the things, and to, of course, make pozole um, or menudo if, if people choose to eat maíz in their menudo. And so that essentially is the nixtamal process. Um, and then once that, that corn has continued to cook until it's tender all the way through, once it's already gone through that, you know, soaking of the nixtamal mixture, um, then you can directly grind that into a paste or into a dough that we know as tortilla dough. And then you add more things to it to make dough for tamales. Um, or you can dry that nixtamalized corn again. And that is what's going to be the corn that we rehydrate in water to make our pozole. So there's also dried masarina. And that masarina was corn that has already gone through nixtamal, was uh, ground and then dried or backwards, dried and then ground, but it's already been nixtamalized. And all you have to do is add hot liquid to it to activate it. All right, now we're good. So I'm gonna go ahead and serve this just to show you how we would bring this whole dish together. But of course, if I, uh, if I weren't doing a live stream right now, I'd have it back on the stove for a little bit and let the flavors marry together. Um, but then we'd just all be staring at each other, uh, waiting for this to, <laughs> to come to a, a complete dish. So let me grab a ladle and a bowl. And I am going to ladle in here. Ooh, so good. Smells so good, looks so good. So I have my, my yeast, my mushrooms, a little bit of broth. I'm gonna ladle that directly into my bowl here. Let me grab a second ladle. Mm, so good. And so this is a foundation. It's like the family pot, right? Where you want it to be seasoned nicely. It doesn't have to be over salted, just enough good bold flavor. And then everybody in the family will eat this a different way. Some people will add a bunch of lemon and more salt and cilantro. Some people just want uh, radishes and col or what is col called in English? It's called uh, cabbage. Um, you know, so everybody will start to take it in their own direction from there. So from here, I'm actually gonna put this bowl down and I think you should be able to see that here. Let me bring this back a little bit. So if you can, oh, no, you can't. <laughs> Let me bring it onto the cutting board. Let me move this pot back onto the stove. And I'm going to bring this bowl here onto the cutting board. And then I'm going to start to add some things that I have here. Why is pozole only served on certain days at a lot of places? Um, because not everybody's eating pozole every day as like a regular meal. But typically that's for menudo. Menudo is a more labor intensive uh, dish to make and menudo is typically only served on Saturdays and or Sundays at restaurants, uh, which is a different dish than this one. So I'm adding some onion, some just diced onion to my pozole. This is totally up to you. It's obviously going to uh, soften slightly with um, the broth being as hot as it is and it'll provide a little bit of crunch as well. I also have just some quartered radishes and I like to leave the little um, ends of the radishes on there. You can slice your radishes if you want, but I really like the crunch of quartered radishes and I add typically around like four or five or so. So you can garnish there. You can add a little bit of just sliced cabbage. This is another kind of crunchiness that you add on there, which you know will get slightly soft 
once it hits that hot broth and you mix it all in. I have some cilantro leaves here. You can have minced cilantro. I like leaving the leaves whole because it adds another little texture in there. Invisibly, it just looks so much nicer. I have lemons, lemons mostly because California grown, these were grown right in my backyard. But if you're a, a lime lover, which some folks are diehard, like only lime in Mexican food, get your lime, that's all good too. So I have cachetes as we call them, when you just cut off one whole slice of the limon, cachetes de limon. You can either put that right on top, I'm just gonna squeeze that right over. And you can add as much limon as you'd like. Growing up, this was like acid central, like my pozole, was so much limon and so much salt. That's the way I grew up eating my pozole. Now as an adult, I don't go that <laughs> that uh, uh, far in that direction, but not too far off either. Um, I have some sal de colima, some really flaky, crunchy Mexican salt from the state of Colima. You can see how big the granules of salt are. That's gonna be a nice finishing salt for me here. I like lots of salt, as you can see. And then tostadas. You want to finish it with just a tostada. This is a tostada raspada, which is typical of Vallarta, Guadalajara, which is a tostada or tortilla that's been kind of scraped um, and then uh, either toasted or fried. Uh, so raspada means scraped. And this is our dish. This is our pozole here that has all the fixings on it. So good. Ooh, so yummy. And I'm gonna just uh, get a bite that has a little bit of everything. And actually, let me break a little piece of tostada in there. I've seen people eat this with bread, with bolillo. So, you know, you can really take this in <laughs> whatever direction. But thank you all so much for joining me. Let me take a quick bite and talk with my mouth full. Mm. So good. The maíz is a star. More maíz in the tostada. And it's all about this balance of crunchiness, saltiness, savor mm, savoriness, acidity. So good. Thank you all so much for joining me in this uh, Pozole Rojo demo. You can always follow us or follow me on Todo Verde to check out more recipes. Thank you again to Tastemade for hosting this. And thank you again to our friends at Honda for making this possible. So hope to see you all on the internet soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you and happy holidays.